Uh, hi everyone. I am going to present our work, Camel Calibrated Accurate uh, Multi-View Time Series Forecasting. Um, so just a brief primer on time series forecasting. It's a very well studied machine learning problem with wide range of applications in many domains like economics, sales, supply chain, weather forecasting, and epidemiology. Um, so generally in the time series forecasting setup, we have time series data from the past as well as some related exogenous features which uh, correspond to some of the generating processes related to the time series. And we train the model using these two data sources to predict the future values of the forecasts. Uh, for example, in the epidemic forecasting, like for flu and COVID, uh, it's useful to predict indicators like case incidence, mortality, which will help in help public health officials in policy planning and intervention planning. Um, so for example, in COVID-19 forecasting, uh, we have the previous data of COVID-19 mortality and some exogenous features like case counts, digital signals, like search queries and mobility signals and so on. And we predict the future mortality of COVID-19. Uh, but these exogenous features can come in different modalities. Like for example, in epidemic forecasting, there could be sequences like number of cases, number of deaths from the past, as well as static features like demographics, unemployment, jobs, or graphs like mobility graphs across regions or travel graphs. Uh, and also another example is sales forecasting where sequences could be in the form of uh, past GDP or indicators of sales and demands, static features like product, uh, uh, product features or financials of the company and graph features include logistic features and so on. Uh, and even these exogenous features could come from multiple data sources, like uh, epidemic forecasting data sources could be from clinical surveillance, social media, mobility data from devices, climate and health data. And for example, when you're predicting for power consumption, it could be from past consumption data or demographics and even weather. So what are the challenges of capturing these multiple data sources and multiple modalities which we call data views so we first have to capture information and uncertainty from each of the multiple data sources and integrate these information and uncertainty from different sources and finally produce well calibrated forecasts so to uh, understand these points more clearly i'll give you an example so for example during the during the covid-19 pandemic initially during the initial months like first 3 4 months uh, Many studies indicated that mobility was a strong indicator of disease spread, whereas line list data, especially in US, was unreliable. Line list data includes uh, data released by public health agencies like CDC, like number of cases, number of tests done, and so on. Whereas later, uh, mobility signals were found to be not as influential, but line list data became more and more and more reliable and standardized, which helped them in helped in becoming more reliable signals for future. Uh, mortality and number of deaths. So, uh, the so the challenge is basically to integrate these beliefs of both modality, um, mobility, and line list data adaptively based upon how reliable they are at each of the different time periods. In general, the challenge is to uh, count uh, account for factors such as encountering uh, conflicting beliefs, data redundancy, and reliability issues from different data views, and also different degree of noise from multiple data views. And finally, we have to pro provide a well calibrated forecast where the forecast mean is close to the ground truth, as well as we provide good confidence intervals which capture the ground truth very well. Uh, for example, uh, in the COVID nineteen season of flu. Uh, there was an unknown, like a novel third peak in the flu incidence, which was not seen in previous flu seasons. And most of the models did not predict that. Whereas our model predicted not only uh, closer to the ground truth, but also provided good confidence estimates so that it captures the ground truth uh, inside the confidence estimates. So given these challenges of multi-view forecasting, uh, we see that past works Usually, uh, most of the previous past works uh, use simple concatenation or aggregation methods to integrate information from multiple uh, views. And also, they don't adaptively aggregate these views and use mostly non-adaptive weight aggregation. And most importantly, they don't capture the uncertainty or noise from each of the views separately. 
So we propose our work, CAMEL, which is a general framework for multi-view probabilistic forecasting, uh, where the goal is to first capture the uncertainty from each of the views using a flexible non-parametric method. And then we use concept sensitive aggregation of the beliefs by weighting them according to their importance. So just a uh, little bit of notation, uh, we index uh, our uh, data as follows, like we use the uh, square brackets for time, uh, subscript for time, time series and uh, the superscript for views. And we also assume uh, that the view one, which is the def default view, the time series. So why, if y are the y represents the values of the time series, then x t i of one is y t of i. Uh, so the goal of multi-view time series forecasting is that we have the time series data of the past, which is represented by y, which is also the default view, and then we have multiple other data views. And the goal is to provide a good uh, dis uh, forecast distribution uh, given the past data as well as past uh, views. Uh, so, uh, the steps of CAMEL is that we first encode the view specific representation and uncertainty, and then uh, we provide importances for each of the views and then decode the, uh, decode, decode the forecast using the combined representations for each of the views. To encode view specific representation and uncertainty, we generalize our previous work on neural process based uh, framework, which combines the power of rep uh, deep learning models as well as non-parametric modeling, uh, which uh, leverages uncertainty from past data points. Uh, so specifically, our uh, model uh, uh, provides a latent representation for each of the views based on the similarity of the input data point with respect to multiple reference data points. And uh, these data Reference data points are basically data points from the past training data set, which represent the entire training data set. For example, for sequence data, we use reference points as past uh, full time series sequences of past seasons, or and the training data point is uh, like the prefix sequences of the current season's uh, time series, which we are training on. Some other examples of reference points are like for demographics, we use feature vectors for each of the states of the country. Uh, and for uh, encoding times, uh, which could be used for seasonal uh, representation, season representation, we can use, we can learn ve vector embeddings for each other uh, um, months or days, depending on the uh, benchmark. So the multi-view probabilistic encoder, which is the first component of CAMEL, basically captures this uncertainty and uh, information from each of the views uh, using uh, by representing a latent a latent embedding for the input uh, data set for each of the views using a multivariate Gaussian, we first encode uh, the information from each of the views using a deep learning based model, depending on the modality, and then uh, use the multivariate Gaussian uh, uh, and parameterize it using a multivariate Gaussian and sample the latent embedding vector Z for each of the views. We do this for both training and reference points, and then uh, find, and then the next step is to uh, leverage the similarity relation between the training and reference points for each of the views to capture both the information and uncertainty for each of the views condition on the input data. Uh, in order to do that, we first sample the reference points for each of the input points that are similar to the reference points. Uh, using the uh, distance between the latent representation. In our case, we use an RBF kernel and we sample uh, the re reference points for each of the input points proportional to the similarity from the RBF kernel. And then we aggregate all the reference points which are sampled from the uh, for each of the input points uh, to parameterize another uh, latent embedding called a view aware latent embedding. Here, LJ is just a feed forward neural network to parameterize the uh, multivariate Gaussian of the latent view embedding, uh, view aware latent latent uh, embedding. Uh, we do this for each of the views separately. So for each of the views, you have separately the reference points for each of the views and also the latent embedding for each of the views from the previous uh, module to get the view aware latent embedding for each of the views. And then our next step is to combine these uh, embeddings for each of the views. Uh, for that, uh, we our model is called the context specific view selection module which first derives the importance for each of the views and then combines the beliefs and the information from each of the views using the uh, inferred importance for each of the views. 
to do that uh, we use a cross attention mechanism uh, we first where the context is the latent embedding for the time series input and we derive the importance for each of the views based on the view aware latent embedding using a cross attention mechanism and then we combine the uh, view aware latent embedding for each of the views uh, weighted by this cross attention weights uh, to get the combined view embedding over all the views and finally we decode the forecast uh, distribution from the combined representation which is a simple feed forward network which takes in the combined view embedding as well as the latent embedding for the input time series into a decoder which is again a feed forward neural network to uh, parameterize the gaussian distribution for the uh, uh, forecast uh, all the modules are trained end to end and we uh, train using stochastic variation inference since there are many latent uh, random variables of high dimension uh, we, we approximate this latent variables for each of the views using the va variational distribution and train the entire model uh, over the elbow loss via stochastic gradient descent uh, more details of the derivation are in the paper now coming to the results we first uh, evaluate our model on various benchmarks uh, with a variety of views. For example, in COVID-19, we have a variety of sequence views from multiple data sources, as well as static view, which is static data, which doesn't uh, change over time, uh, along with the graph view. We also have another benchmark called Google symptoms, where the Google goal is to predict a, a flu, flu, flu incidence indicator called WLI. Uh, and we have multiple views for each of, for this benchmark as well. We also have tweet to topic prediction benchmark where the goal is to predict the future topic distribution of the tweets uh, based on the past topic distribution of the tweets which are related to COVID-19. And we have the power consumption benchmark, which is another standard benchmark. We, uh, we use views for months and time of day. Uh, for the baseline, we compare against general probabilistic forecasting methods using some of the methods which also integrate graph representation and uh, benchmark specific baselines like for flu we compare against top of st state of the art flu forecasting benchmarks and for COVID-19 also we again compare against the state of the art COVID forecasting benchmarks. For, uh, uh, firstly, we find that we significantly uh, get we get significant improvement over uh, other models in uh, all the benchmarks. We measure our performance using CRPS uh, score, uh, and secondly, we see that uh, Camel uh, takes all the views into account to improve the performance. It's not just that we use one or two views. Our performance is uh, significantly better when we used all the views, and not not just one or two best views. Uh, then we also study the importance of dynamic view selection by comparing it against two variants of camel, uh, where instead of doing dynamic selection using cross attention, we use simple concatenation as well as static weights, which don't change across time. And we find that these variants are uh, significantly worse than camel, and in some cases worse than the baselines as well. And in order to uh, study the weights learned by the dynamic view selection module. We uh, look at first the predictive utility of each of the views by uh, first training the camel model with the default time series view and a given view of interest and evaluate the uh, e evaluate the two view variant of camel. Uh, and then we find that uh, the, the predictive utility of the view, which is inverse to the CRPS is a proportional uh, to the weight. So, so the camel automatically identifies the views which have higher predictive utility when we are training, a, training with all the views together. And for another case study recap that we find that the line list uh, data was initially not as influential when doing COVID-19 forecasting, but later it became more influential. So we find that uh, similarly for the, in the view selection model for the first few months, we find that the mobility, uh, view has much higher weight compared to the line list view for some of the more densely populated states. So this shows that CAMEL adaptively recognizes which view is important based on the context. So to summarize, we present CAMEL, a non-parametric neural probabilistic framework for multi-view forecasting, both multi-source and multi-modal, uh, which are, extracts the data uh, uncertainty from each of the views and provides superior performance in diverse benchmarks. We also show uh, with case studies that it adapts to various degrees of noise from each of the different views.
Uh, thank you, and I'm open to the questions. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Harsha, right? So yeah, yeah, so we will go ahead and then take some time for the questions now. So the audience, are there any questions to the Harsha? Harsha, sorry, yeah, <laughs> no, the pronunciation is a little bit hard. No, oh, sorry. yeah, um, someone raised the hand and then, yeah, please turn your mic yeah, on and then yeah. ask the question, um, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I just one, had one quick question about the reference set. I didn't quite understand where this reference set comes from, if it's a part of the training set or if it's... Uh... Yeah, so the reference set is e extracted from the training set. Uh, like, uh, for example, in the uh, for the sequences, we have multiple uh, time series from the past and the present. So the reference sets are basically the full time series of the past data. Whereas the training set is the prefix sequences of the current season's training set. Oh, uh, whereas okay, okay. Uh, for uh, other features like demographics, there are fixed number of states. So each of the states have their own reference set and the input also has, this, has the same feature vector. So they both uh, match. match. Okay. So yeah, it depends on the views, and, but it uh, catches the entire another... training set. Yeah. Okay. So I had another Related question, for, there was one step where you choose the k-nearest neighbors um, for deciding, so uh, yeah, here. Um, so here, how, how do you, which, how, so how many neighbors do you choose? How do you know how many neighbors? To okay, choose? so uh, this is a stochastic process. So we sample edges between the uh, reference set and the training set based on this RBF kernel. Which, uh, which uses the uh, Euclidean distance for similarity. And uh, for, e for each of the inference step, like the sampling could yield like um, different candidate set of neighbors. So it's a sampling process. It, there's no fixed number of uh, okay, neighbors. Okay. okay, thanks a lot. Great, so and then are there any questions from the audience? One question, we can take it. Uh, then if not, actually I have a, a simple question. So, Actually, so when I see the non-parametric, then I'm very curious about the time complexity. So can you, did you also measure the, the, whether the theoretically or the practically time complexity compared to the baselines? Uh, we found that in most cases, our model does perform uh, much faster than some of the larger baselines. And we have not, like the number of parameters in our model has, uh, the model is also very small compared to the baselines. So in, in practice, we did find that uh, it's much faster in inference and training also compared to some of the baseline. Oh, I see. Yeah. So thank you for your answers.